Hi, everyone. Welcome to our second to last week. This week, we're talking about culture jamming and memes. Your first reading is from Lemur Schiffman, professor at, at the Department of Communication and Journalism at the Hebrew University in Israel, and also the author of Memes in Digital Culture, which you have an excerpt from this week. She is an expert on memes in digital culture. So she draws heavily on, in your reading, she draws heavily on Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene from 1976. Dawkins is an evolutionary biologist, and he was also politically active as a known atheist and talked a lot about how life evolves through replication processes, and he identifies three of the ways that that happens, longevity, fecundity, and copy fidelity. So longevity, length of life, fecundity is reproductive capacity, and copy fidelity is basically that the reproduced offspring or in this case, when we're talking about memes, remain uh, close to the, the original, right? So the way that Schiffman, building on this, says that theory applies to digital culture is through three ways. She says gradual propagation from individual to society, meaning that individuals will reproduce something and it becomes, it gets a certain degree of saturation and therefore becomes visible at a broader level. Um, and reproduction via copying and imitation, that's part of how that happens, and these things happen in tandem. And then finally, diffusion through competition and selection, meaning, of course, that in meme culture, people work to produce new versions of a meme, new takes on it, and that what kind of gets selected by the crowd to become more popular and becomes more reproduced as a kind of selection competition project. So one example of this is the distracted boyfriend meme. It's a bit old now, but it still seems to refuse to die. So I'm pretty sure you've all seen this. It's probably many of you anyway, where there's a man walking with his girlfriend holding hands, presumably his girlfriend, right? And he's caught looking at another girl as she's passing by who unironically or ironically looks almost identical to the girlfriend. And that kind of is part of the meme, right? And this has been remixed over and over in a number of different ways. And part of your assignment for participation this week will be to be bringing in memes and talking about what's happening in them through the reading that we're having this week. So this might be something that appears in some of your colleagues' posts. I'm assuming some people will have versions of this that come up because, as I said, it refuses to die, which is maybe that longevity point, right, of Dawkins' theory. Another example of a meme that has had a lot of longevity and a lot of reproduction is the roll safe meme, which has been really popular on Black Twitter. And this was from, this is an image macro series originally referencing a character named Reese Simpson, who, is all, who also went by roll safe in the web series Hood documentary. And basically it's intended, it's used to like mock people for poor decision making and in general kind of encourages people to just be more critical and have more critical thought about the way that they're perceiving culture a lot of the time too, right? So it's often used in comment section dialogues. She also talks about some political memes and some examples include the We Are the Resistance meme, which is uses the Star Wars um, imagery and also the aesthetics of the text look like you may recognize it from either the brand Supreme or where it was originally from and Supreme stole it from, which is the artist Barbara Kruger, who was a political artist in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And another meme is the Trump is Voldemort meme. These are both pretty he these were pretty heavily used during the days of the Trump administration and protests at the inauguration and in the women's march back in 2017 and they still both continue to be used like off and on and I'm sure you can all think of more examples of political memes and again I hope these come up in our discussion board this week I hope you're using some of those too and discussing what political memes you're seeing this time so we're moving quick this week. I know it's the end of the semester and everybody's stressed, so we're going to just jump straight to our second reading. The second reading that you have is Christine Harrell, who is a professor and chair of communication at the University of Washington, and she's the author of Pranking Rhetoric, Culture Jamming as Media Activism, which is part of a larger compilation on culture jamming. I chose to give you guys mostly historical context for what's been happening in digital culture. 
So the term culture jamming is based on a term from citizen band radio or CB radio, used often by like truck drivers and other people. And the slang word jamming means to disrupt existing transmission. So it usually implies any kind of interruption, sabotage, hoax, prank, banditry, blockage of whatever is seen as the monolithic power structures governing cultural life. That's how she's defining the way that she's using culture jamming beyond jam in its original CB radio slang context. So one example Harold gives is the Barbie Liberation Organization or the BLO, which was a prank project and that in it pranks the infamously litigious Mattel group who has been known or M Mattel Corp who's been known to sue many artists or other kinds of cultural commentators who've used the Barbie image or other aspects of their products in their kinds of project work as artists or as cultural critics. Many of you probably had Barbie dolls growing up and I'm sure most of you have seen the Barbie movie or at least familiar with it. Um, and how much Barbie has been exem exemplified, uh, used to exemplify gender stereotyping, whether in the way that the Barbie movie means to be critical of it while also reproducing it, um, or in ways that are, you know, more inherent to the historical capacity of Barbie as producing these ideas of what ideal femininity is, right? So the BLO in the 90s was started in 89, I'm sorry, not 90s. The BLO switched the voice boxes of the Teen Talk Barbie and the Talking G.I. Joe doll. So that's, this meant that Barbie would suddenly have this like deep voice and she talked about and she used military phrases and G.I. Joe would talk about wedding planning and how hard math was because that doll actually, the Barbie talked about math is hard. And so they switched those and that's a big part of why they did it was because of what was being said by those two dolls to begin with. So this reversal of gender roles and expectations was not particularly well received by a lot of people. They did this voice box switch and then put the dolls back on the shelves to be sold during the Christmas season to unknowing customers and also then children would be then receiving them as gifts. So this resulted in a little bit of a public outcry. Outcry is an overstatement. What happened is there were a couple of people who were angry, like a number of people who were angry. But really what happened was the media did a lot of interviewing of upset parents about this and made it a much bigger story than it really probably was. Um, but of course, people felt they'd spent money with an expectation and didn't get the thing they wanted. Right. And so this brings up a whole bunch of different kinds of responses and asked questions a lot of things about expectations of gender it was also quite funny so there's this response video which is on the next slide and that is barbie as a sort of spokesperson speaking for the international network of toys and their desire to be liberated it's quite good hi i'm teen talk barbie the spokes doll for the b l o that stands for the Barbie Liberation Organization. We're an international group of children's toys that are revolting against the companies that made us. We've turned against our creators because they use us to brainwash kids. They build us in a way that perpetuates gender-based stereotypes. Those stereotypes have a negative effect on children's development. We have set up our own hospitals where we are carrying out corrective surgery on ourselves. Now we say things like this. I donated my voice to a G.I. Joe, because they want to be free too. They don't want to say all that violent war stuff. Now he says what I used to say. Where are the shopping? School, don't you? Have time. Well, we don't have enough clothes. After we finish our corrective surgery, we climb back into our cartons and are shipped to stores everywhere. Watch carefully now as the doll leaves his hand and is placed back on the shelf. A time bomb waiting for the unsuspecting yes. customer. Now watch as two other BLO members brazenly replace 
at least a half a dozen more Barbie dolls at another nearby store. Use 8, San Diego's number one source for news. Seven-year-old Zag Zeblin thought this doll was a factory mistake, like but it was soon discovered this G.I. Joe was in fact ambushed by the Barbie Liberation Organization. He's in disguise. In press releases, the group claims to have gotten 300 altered Barbies and G.I. Joes onto store shelves in 43 states. This little-known faction of underground toy terrorists is waging a video war, claiming responsibility for the sex change operations. I like it because it isn't so fiery and it makes it more funny. It is nothing sacred. If protesters can tamper with the voices of children's icons, what can be next? So the second example Harold gives and that I'm going to highlight here is the BBB or the Biotic Baking Brigade. And so in the late 90s, this political art group was developed that their mission was to publicly deliver pies to quote unquote pompous people. The BBB victims included Bill Gates, the CEO of Monsanto, the CEO of Chevron, the, the mayor of San Francisco, the World Trade Organization chief, Renato Ruggiero among many others, but they really primarily identified people who had a lot of economic or political power in society as targets for pieing. This image that's here on this slide, this is a woman named Shifley. Mrs. Shifley, she was, some of you may have seen Mrs. America, a television series that I believe was on Hulu, talking about the rise of the conservative right and a certain kind of resistance to the women's liberation and the ERA is the Equal Rights Amendment in the 70s. Phyllis Shipley, that is her here being pied. She's actually not being pied by the BBB. This is prior to the BBB because this has been a kind of political tactic used in the United States off and on by different political groups for a while. But in this case, we're talking about the BBB doing it in the 90s. They also created a video press release explaining some of their activity called The Pie is the Limit, which I also have linked in the next slide for you to check out. The brigade was formed in the summer of 1997 to deliver a delicious mischief to Charles Hurwitz, the CEO of Max Sam Corporation, parent company of uh, Pacific Lumber, which is cutting down the Headwaters Forest. Since then, it's grown into a network, and we understand that there is a vast number of militant bakers, both here in the city as well as up north in the Headwaters Forest. I couldn't estimate numbers, but we understand that there are many people who feel like there are many folks who need their just desserts, and we know how to dish it up. Well, I would add to that. I would add to that. The only thing that's necessary to be a member of the Biotic Baking Brigade is a pie and a vision of a better world. It's also an act of violence. Someone is hurt. The mayor's limping, people are upset, there's melee after the, the incidents. Mm -hmm. and, and also the police chief of San Francisco is threatening to prosecute. First of all, I've read in the paper now that he first had a bruise in his stomach, then his knee, now his ankle. He made 20 public appearances that day. I have some doubts about this alleged injury. Furthermore, a great many people found it terribly funny. And also, it's, a, it's an unusual approach that we take. And we think it's quite effective, actually. The difference in reaction between the people on the street and the people in the halls of power has been extreme. There's no misdemeanor. It is a felony. And I hope that we will stop the laughing now. The fun is over. The joke should stop. Particularly in the situation with the pieing of <laughs> Willie Brown in San Francisco, it's really clarified a lot of those class issues is when... When you have people saying, this is terrible, this is a crisis of incivility, I think is what Amos Brown said, and just blowing this up into a huge thing, but all the people who are treating this like it's a great crisis, like a, a very serious issue, are the people in power, are people who, you know, who have influence and who have a lot to lose if people no longer respect that influence. But on the other hand, the people who are living on the streets or living a paycheck away from the streets, they're laughing their asses off. And who knows what was in that attache case? Write that to the podium. Laid it down with the pies in it. It should never be the case that persons would be permitted to get that close to our mayor in public functions such as it was on Saturday. Mayor Brown could have fallen back and the fall would not have been broken and he could have suffered a brain concussion. 
This is a serious matter. We're talking about high crimes and misdemeanors. Monday, between sessions in court, they were back on the street. Was it worth this? It's hard to put it in terms like that. Obviously, I didn't expect anything like broken bones as a result of pieing. Rahula Janowski claims a friend of the mayor broke her shoulder after she tossed her pie. Where is the justice when Garland Rosario grabs a woman, puts his knee in her back, I'm referring to Rahula Janowski, reaches up under her arms and pulls her back. That's a kill move. It's like, like the bottom line in San Francisco is if you're wearing a uniform, a police uniform, or if you're wearing a suit and you work in City Hall, and you can commit crimes against endless people and hair people and people of color, and you will not be prosecuted, you will not be jailed. Whereas if you are as an political activist and you serve three suits to hungry people like hung up bombs, or throw a pie in somebody's face who can't take a joke, you're actually beaten, you're actually arrested, you're incarcerated, and you're forced to go to trial. Your reaction to the set is... I mean, third. a shock and sustained. Uh, so rather appalled, although unfortunately not necessarily completely surprised given what we faced here. So, uh, six months says that this is the absolute positively worst batteries that could ever happen. His way is disproportionate, completely disproportionate. So what is a hill breed in this case? The point is not us being on trial necessarily for throwing a pie. The point is there are a lot of people dying on the streets of the city and it needs to be dealt with. For sentencing, but they said today, don't be surprised if we see more pie throwing incidents at public officials. In fact, as one member of the Biotic Baking Brigade said today, there is a pastry uprising going on, not just in this country. They are at it again. The group of activists who pied Mayor Willie Brown attacked Chevron's CEO outside of San Francisco school today. And members of the Biotic Baking Brigade videotaped the attack at Galileo High. These are their pictures. So what is behind this very public campaign? ABC 7's Don Sanchez joins us from the scene of today's attack with the story. Don? Okay, as you said, indeed, the Biotic Brigade once again, and the pie throwers are videotaping at Galileo High School here in the marina. This time, the target, the Chevron CEO, Kenneth Durr. Durr was here to, to give a speech, actually. He was going to give a speech when he was pelted by four pie-wielding activists. They claim they were targeting him for what they say is Chevron's alleged involvement in the murders of rebels in Nigeria. The pie throwers that ran away, Durr went on inside. School officials say the pie throwers were not students, and I can confirm they are part of that same group that pied Mayor Willie Brown. I talked to one of the pie throwers. As long as our uh, political and cancer leaders are willing to lie, we are willing to pie. My friend, Joe Alberti, he said, hey, man, this guy's so impressed. impressed. I look around, I've seen pie all over the sex, pumpkin pie and blueberry pie. And then the guys took off running and there was two cameramen with them. So it was like it was a big setup. I said, man, that's all they took pie. All four of them are being sought on uh, battery charges. The third member of the Biotic Baking Brigade, who uh, pied Mayor Woody Brown, went to jail today, all three of them serving six months. Uh, but today, tell me, uh, Salmonberry tells me, Agent Salmonberry, that's not going to tour any of the activists. In fact, they're going to spread their pie throwing worldwide. Live in San Francisco, Don Sanchez, ABC 7 News. Uh, our next caller, I think, is one of your colleagues, Sal Decker. It's a man who calls himself Agent Warcry. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. A woman, excuse me, named Agent Warcry. That's correct. I am a woman. It said to serve a spectacle. And I'd just like to say about Milton Friedman, one of the people we pied. He was one of Reagan's closest economic advisors, and, and those top down neoliberal approaches have resulted in a great deal of misery and decimation of people's lives. For in the 80s, Milton Friedman was also one of Sinorte's advisors in his administration on economic policies, and Sinorte was a mass murderer. Where is the accountability in that? Where is the accountability when Charles Perwitz raped the ancient pristine forests of Northern California and the state rewards him for it? Yeah. Health has perverted our political process and our society, let's face it, and the media has failed to do its job and have forced to resort to these tactics and voice to have any voice, whatever, on these critical issues. And this is the first thing that's eased my sense of despair at the futility of social activism, which is so often just Dismissed and ignored. You got your voice in this morning, and I'm glad you did. I thank you for the call. Let me get Roberts. 
What's that sailing through the air? In the boardroom, see them shiver. You can spend your life open for pie in the sky. The beating Christine does never What's that sailing through the air? In the boardroom, see them shiver. You can spend your life open for pie in the sky. But the beating Christine does never They pied Willy Brown. Excellent. What? They pied Willy Brown. I haven't seen that since Wavy Gravy got some free. They can't make me. Another iteration of culture jamming that Harold talks about is Adbusters. Adbusters is a still active culture jamming punk magazine that was founded in 1989 by Kaya Lawson. And the goal of Adbusters was to use advertising techniques and strategies and aesthetics against capitalism. And this often took the form of parody products, as you can see here in this parody Nike shoe, which breaks down the cost of making a thing versus what it's sold for in a store. So a number of the activist, artist, punk collective members of Adbusters had had previous experience working and advertising themselves. And so they had this great knowledge of how advertising campaigns worked. And they used that in their resistance projects and parodies. Early examples of Adbusters work that you have here include some spoof ads. They did like Absolute Coma, which is a joke on Absolute Vodka, which had spent a huge amount of money in the late in the 80s and 90s on these really elaborate ad campaigns. Then here they've replaced it with, with an IV bag. There's a McDonald's parody with grease written across the mouth. And finally, a common kind of 1970s aesthetic, 80s aesthetic cigarette ad of an attractive young woman being turned against smoking. So as you can see, they're really explicitly using like familiar images and advertising tactics created by these companies against the companies themselves. So to give you guys a little taste of their tone in Adbusters, here's an excerpt from the um, Culture Jammers Manifesto of 1999. America is no longer a country. It's a multi-trillion dollar brand, essentially no different from McDonald's, Marlboro, Marlboro or General Electric's. It's an image sold not only to the citizens of the United States, but to consumers worldwide. The American brand is associated with catchwords such as democracy, opportunity, and freedom. But like cigarettes that are sold as symbols of vitality and youthful rebellion, the American reality is very different from its brand image. America has been subverted by corporate agendas. Its elected officials bow before corporate power as a condition of their survival in office. A collective sense of powerlessness and disillusionment has set in. A deeply felt sense of betrayal is brewing. How do people respond to that growing sense of despair? I think part of the point of this is that culture jamming and messing with our systems of legitimacy, the ways that we recognize power and order in the world, whether that's corporate culture and the aesthetics of advertising, or here I'm going to talk to you guys about another group of, jam of culture jammer prankster artists who used uh, reproduced fictitious fictitious creation of a newspaper as a means of cultural critique, right? So that frustration, that sense of despair is met with mean culture jamming, ways of trying to push back in, in against what are set to be like norms of our hegemonic culture, right? Going back to that original definition of what jamming is. So this is one of my favorites. This is by a group called the Yes Men. One week after the historic election of Barack Obama as the president of the United States, tens of thousands of copies of a special edition of the New York Times appeared on the streets of New York City. Headlines announced that the end announced the end of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, along with victories around climate change and economic equality. Unfortunately, Obama had taken no such bold action, 
by the way, this is from their YouTube channel. The paper was a provocation designed to encourage thousands of people to reflect upon the divergence between the world we actually live in and the world that we could live in if we demanded it. The paper was produced by the mischievous imposters known as the Yes Men, who enlisted a thousand volunteers to help with the stunt, right? People handed these papers out. As one of the group's leading members, Andy Bicklum, said of the group's motivation, we've elected Obama, but so what? Now we all have to push to make things actually happen, right? For those who maybe you guys might not remember or know, Obama ran on a campaign of hope. And so there was a big sense that this was this incredibly impactful election. What we now know is that was actually one of the most hawkish, meaning we had the most, some of the, the largest military actions during the Obama administrations that we've ever had. So there was a lot of sense of letdown of what people were hoping for as far as what would change in the country and what would change with how the country was behaving internationally. It did not really come to fruition. And so this short film that will be on the next slide documents the Yes Men's stunt and shows reactions from passersby who reflected on the presentation of what the Yes Men have referred to a fair, as a fairer world that is, in, with it, that, is in, that is within reach, but that must be fought for by us. There have been many other political art activists, hacktivist collectives that have been inspired by culture jamming, by ad busters, by art groups like the Yes Men, who've made all kinds of interesting projects and interventions in space. One such one is Subvertisers of London, and I have given you guys uh, a link to that as well. And that's actually in your media link as well as it'll be on the next slide. They're still active today. They do really great work criticizing the way that our public spaces, as minimal as they are now, have all been sold for advertising dollars and encouraging people to learn how to hack that space and do other things with it. What would it mean if we took back over our public spaces? So please check that out. I hope you guys will talk about some of these really interesting projects in our discussion post this week. Also bring us, bring me memes, culture jamming things that you see in the world that you think are interesting, other punk projects, other ways people have tried to pushed back against the way that whether it's physical space or digital space has been sold to corporate interests. Yeah, so that's it for this week. I just wanted to touch base on a couple of other things really quickly. There's no journal for this week and there wasn't one last week. You guys should be thinking about really working on drafts of your final project. Come to me if you have any questions. I will also be posting some examples for you of what you might want to think about doing for your video component of that. So if any of you have taken Intro to Media with me or anyone else who does a mass media mini lecture or a bite-sized lecture or any of those, right, using formats like TikTok or Instagram Reels or anything like that to try and get you guys to use functions like green screen or whatever to talk about what you're finding in your research or other things like that as a way of delivering a kind of minimal bite-sized version of your findings to your colleagues in an engaging way. If you've ever taken those classes, you will have seen versions of that. I will also give you some versions of that. I don't have any for this class because it's my first time teaching this one, but I'm hoping that you guys will have some interesting ideas about how to make use of that space to build on your project. It's not a huge part of your grade, but it is something that I'm hoping you'll take advantage of for thinking about what it means to represent knowledge in different ways other than papers, right? Because I think we didn't talk about that this much, talk about this that much in this course this semester, but as AI writing becomes more and more important, I think it's important for us to think about, or at least more prevalent, right? It's important for us to think about other ways of representing knowledge as an important part of what education should include. So I'm trying to give you guys spaces to express your knowledge in other ways. You can do it with video. People sometimes don't want to be on camera, so you can do your videos as like slides and audio. I've done that here for this class mostly because I've had issues off and on with my camera all semester and it would just cause you trouble to have to wait for my camera to work consistently 
But I also know people sometimes are just more comfortable that way. It's up to you what you want to do. People have done little mini podcasts where there's no visuals at all and they're just doing a talk through. That is not reading a paper. Keep in mind, those are different things. But you can come to me with ideas about what you think you might want to do. And if you have any questions about where you're at with your writing, I'm also going to post for you guys a little, or I did actually, I did post a breakdown of what it means to do a five-step analysis process for your research representation in your paper. If any of you have any questions about that or you're feeling a little uncertain, let me know. I'm here to help. And yeah, I hope you guys had a good break last week. And I look forward to seeing what you all have to say this week about this topic.